Jesus, the good God. Thank you very much, Brother Sig Paul. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. Let me begin with a story. This week, I was coming into church, could have been Friday, and I was just by the parking lot out there, and a sister was coming from the church, going away. And so we met there, we started to talk. And then something happened. Some money fell out of her hand, purse, pocket, on the ground, and the priest started to blow it, and she started to run behind this note. Hundred dollars. And uh, as she chased after the note, it blew into the drain. And then I used to step forward. I was coming behind her now, trying to assist her in retrieving the note. I stepped forward and I put my hand in the drain and I took it out. And as I took it out, the Lord spoke to me. This is the message. Regardless of where this money has blown into, it does not change the value of the money. It does not change the value of the money. I don't know who you're running after. I don't know who you are. But your value in the sight of God does not change regardless of where you find yourself. Regardless of where you end up. You and I are made in the image and likeness of God. And so regardless of where you find yourself, that redemptive act we took the money, we went to the sink there, used some soap, used some water, wash it out, used some tissue, mop it out, and it was good to go to be spent again. Because that money still remained legal tender. Brothers and sisters, there are times when we will find ourselves in places where we ought not to find ourselves and then we think all is over. Then we think, well, God done with us. All we deserve now is to be thrown into the rubbish heap, into the trash can. I want to say to you, that message of the money going into the train did not change the value of the money. Yes, it was dirty, Yes, it needs to be cleaned up. But the fact remains that the value of the money did not change. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We are created in the image and likeness of God. God is our papa. When you are the maker of something and you claim ownership to that, you are given the legal right, which is called a patent, a patent, because you recognize as the person who has brought forth this article, this song, this software, hardware, whatever it might be, you are, you have the paternal right. You have the patent stamp. You are the owner of that thing. We are patented by God. Because he made us. And we are created in his image and likeness. So I just want to share that with you. In case you are wondering if you have less value or no value. Less worth or no worth. In the sight of God. Regardless of where the winds might have blown you, I want to say to you that you are still valuable in the sight of God. You still have God's stamp on you. 
And so the man who is staggering and finds himself in the gutter still has the image of God in him. The woman who is living her life in such a way that we want to label her and call her a bad woman, she still has, regardless of where she is, regardless of where she finds herself at this moment, she still has the image of God. She still is made in the image and likeness of God. Brothers and sisters, that's why God is after souls. Because he wants us to redeem. He wants us to buy them back. He wants to buy them back. Because he's already paid with his blood. And we have a mission, a mandate. We have a motivation to go and to share this good news so that those who don't know Jesus can come to know him. Or those who have wandered away from him can return to him and have fellowship with him. This morning I shared and I was wondering if I should still share it with you today at the second service. But I'm going to do so. Listen to this. Church is hard. Church is hard for the person walking through the doors afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home, broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together, but doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire ride to the service. Church is hard for the single mom surrounded by couples holding hands and seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and widower with no invitation to lunch after service. Church is hard for the deacon with an estranged child. Church is hard for the person singing worship songs, overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics. Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to love. Church is hard for the single woman and single man Praying God that God brings them a maid. Church is hard for the teenage girl wearing a scarlet letter, ashamed of her mistakes. Church is hard for the sinners. Church is hard for me. It's hard because of the outside, on the outside, it all looks shiny and perfect. Sun the best. In behavior and dress. However, underneath those layers, you find the body of imperfect people, carnal souls, selfish motives. But here is the beauty of church church isn't a building, mentality, or expectation. Church is a body. Church is a group of sinners saved by grace living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters by an eternal love. Church is a holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts and a training ground for mighty warriors. Church is a converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of burdens and a giver of hope. Church is a family. A family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes. Rejoicing in the smallest of victories. Church, the body, and the circle of sinners' thorn saints is where he resides 
If we ask, he is faithful to come. So even on the hard days at church, the days when I'm at odds with a friend, when I fought with my spouse because we were late once again, when I've walked in bearing burdens heavier than my heart can handle, yet masking the pain with a smile on my face, when I've worn a scarlet letter under the microscope, when I've longed for a baby to hold or fought back tears as the lyrics were sung, when I've walked away, when I've walked back in, afraid and broken after walking away, I remember he has never failed to meet me there. This is a poem that was sent to me early in February by my dear friend and brother, Brother Corti Frank, written by Jacob Waldron. And I've always been waiting for an opportunity, right opportunity to share it. And I thought it was a good moment to share it. It comes in a place where this poem, reading this poem, we'll be focusing on God's work among the nation of Israel and how that centrally, focally, not tangentially, not in the periphery, but the center of God's will, there's a message for us today. Would you turn with me to God's servants writing the word of God, inspired by God, reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. Jeremiah, chapter 18. We'll read the first six verses. So Jeremiah 18, 1 to 6. And as a way of keeping us engaged and involved, I'd like to ask you that if we can read alternately. So I'll read one, you'll read two, I'll read three, and so on. And together, we will read verse 6. So let us go. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, Cannot I do with you as this potter, said the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Let us pray. Father, we ask you today in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters on Zoom, scattered in different places, but yet we are united in Christ. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here in the congregation, here in the sanctuary. Lord God, thank you for bringing us together. And as we go into your word, your word which has the ability to change and to transform, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. Lord, that your word will come to us today in a real way. And Lord God, that your word but bring about the change that you desire. Let your word, Lord, take root and bring forth fruit. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. 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 This is a very interesting passage of scripture. This is a passage that God gives us in his word for us to reflect on his dealings with the children of Israel, his people. But we are also told that whatever 
was written before time was written also for our learning so that there is a value in understanding the context but there's also value and God expects us to make the application the writer of this book Jeremiah he is also called the wailing prophet or the weeping prophet because Jeremiah went through hardships he had an assignment from God and was one of the most difficult assignments because the people to whom he was sent they did not want to receive that word so Jeremiah was brutalized he was persecuted he was imprisoned he was rejected because they refused to attack the messenger instead of listening and receiving the message. The context, the broader context of this passage is where Israel had just come out of being controlled by being under the captivity of the Assyrians. It wasn't long after, but just before this message that Jeremiah brought, that the Babylonians had come along, they fought against the Assyrians, they whipped the Assyrians, they held the Assyrians and the Israelites captive because every land that Assyria had controlled, now that the Babylonians had gained power, they controlled those lands and so two things happened one is that the Babylonians took a lot of the nation of Israel and they exiled them out of their land and took them into Babylon the second thing that happened is that there was a remnant who remained in the land a remnant of Jews, of Israelites, of God's people who remained in the land. And there was this conflict, as it were, where there were some people who were bringing prophecies to tell the Israelites that this journey into Babylon was just a short time experience. Before too long, they were going to go back into their homeland. But God wanted them to know that he was at work to bring to pass his purposes even in the midst of all the pain that they were going through. And so God chose Jeremiah to be the bearer of the news. That they ain't got no going home to go home just now. God wants to bring to pass his purposes. And so God said, Jeremiah, Jerry, I want you to understand something. I have a message for you. As a matter of fact, I have a message through you for the nation. So we are told the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord say. God was about to speak. God was about to give Jeremiah a message. So it was a very vocal message. A vocal message. God wanted Jeremiah to understand. That he had a word for the nation. He was going to give him a vocal message. But God speaks in different ways. He speaks audibly, vocally, like you hear my voice. And then God also speaks by actions. He demonstrates, he illustrates. So verbal and nonverbal communication. God is a great communicator. Verse 2 says, this is what God says to Jeremiah. 
Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Arise. Get up from where you are. What I want to say to you, I don't want to say it where you are. I want to move you out of where you are. And I want you to go to a certain place. And I want you to observe. I want you to see something. And then I'm going to speak. So God did not only want to give a vocal message. God wanted to give a visual message. Another V. God wanted to give a visual message. So Jeremiah says, Then I went down to the potter's house. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. So Jeremiah went down there, the potter was working. He was busy on the potter's wheels doing his job. Another day in the life of a potter. Another day dealing with mother, dealing with clay. Another day of the messiness of, pot of pottery. But it was an important day for God, for Jeremiah, and for Israel. Jeremiah said, as he beheld the potter walking, as he was working with his hands at the potter's wheel, he saw that the vessel, verse 4, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. So Jeremiah observed that this mud, this vessel, this mud became a vessel in formation, in the making. And before, while it was being structured and formed and all the contours were right and everything was going, it was spinning there and all of that, Jeremiah began to observe and he saw Something beautiful that was emerging. The craftsman, the expertise, the craftsmanship, the expertise, the work of the potter was bringing forth something beautiful. I wanted to find a, a pottery somewhere. I wanted to go down to some place, a potter's shop, pottery, to see this whole thing. I wanted, in a sense, to reenact, to get an, a clearer understanding of what Jeremiah saw. I don't know if I didn't search hard enough, but I didn't find any. I know that we have a potter in the house, Sister Kati Enrico, as part of our training part of our art as a practicing artist. Not sure how much of that she does now. But I went to the next best place. The place that you and I go when we can't come up with the answer to some things. How to bake this, how to make this, how to cook this, how to fix this. You know where we go? YouTube, we Google it. Yes. So I went to YouTube, but I had some time and I'm looking at this, these scenes of pottery and pottery making. Jeremiah observed as he went down in living colors to this house of pottery. That the vessel that the potter made, he said, it was marred in the hand of the potter. The vessel that the potter made, this beautiful vessel that was emerging, alas, there was calamity. 
Alas, there was disappointment. There was something that did not come out right. The whole thing was no good. And so Jeremiah looked and he saw not a predictable outcome that he would have had in his mind of this thing being thrown away, pick up another lump of clay and get going again. Jeremiah saw that the hand of the potter was to take this vessel and do a remake. Brothers and sisters, if there is one title that I can give to this message is that God is in the remaking business. God is in the remaking business. And so God wanted Jeremiah to see this because he wanted to communicate to Israel, to the nation that though they did not emerge in the way he wanted, Though Israel did not fulfill his expectations. Though Israel did not walk in his commandments. Though Israel did not conform to what God desires of them. God said to Jeremiah. Just like all house of Israel. Cannot I do with you as this potter? The potter made his vessel again. So, verse 4 says, So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. That was not the end of the story Jeremiah saw. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, This is what God said. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? said the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Brothers and sisters, as we look at the story as emerging from this passage, we can't help but notice that in the midst of what is called in the, that the Old Testament is a place of law. We can't help but see here that the grace of God is emerging. We can't help but see that God does not cast us away and throw us off and forget about us and write us off even when his formation of us the outcome is not what he expects. So God says in verse 6, he gives this message, a vocal message. Yes, a visual message. But God also gave a vital message. A very vital message. And the message is, I want to make, remake you. I want to reset you. God wanted Israel to know and he wants us to know if I can plunge into an application right now. God wants us to know that it is not over until he says it is over. God wants to know that his grace is for us, extended to us. And so while we are living in a place, maybe in a wasteland, Maybe we have walked away from the presence of God. Maybe we are living in a place where God does not want us to live. Maybe the works of God and the plans of God and the purposes of God are emerging in our lives. Some time ago, they could only be referenced in the past tense. God is saying, I've still got a future for you. I still want to remake you. I still want to make you afresh. And so, brothers and sisters, God wants us to know, as he said to Israel, as he gave that vital word to Jeremiah, God wants you to know that he has a vital message for you also. And the vital message is that 
He still got you. The vital message that he's not given up on you. The vital message is that he is still making you. He's still forming and shaping and fashioning us. And so he still has us like the potter, in the, like the clay in the hands of that potter. God wants us to know that he has us in his hands. You know what keeps us going? When God comes to us and says something to us, and he gives us a vital message. And I have no doubt that God has been speaking to us in different ways. I have no doubt that God has been speaking to you. Giving you a word and you can't understand that word. Maybe one word, a short sentence. It might not even be a paragraph. It might just be a few words. And God is stirring your heart. God is reminding you. Maybe a word of scripture. Maybe a word that somebody spoke to you. Maybe a word impressed upon you by the Holy Spirit. God wants you to know. That he's speaking. He has a word that he's giving to you. That is what keeps us going. The Apostle Peter, God had to do a remake on that servant of his. There was a time when Peter zealously served the Lord Jesus. He was one of the disciples. And we all know the pronouncements of Peter. Even Peter declared, Lord, you're not going to the cross. You're not dying. If it comes down, and I got to shed I got my life. If I got to take my life, you're not going down. You're not going to die. But we saw not too long hence that Peter denied the Lord. But then Jesus came and said, I have a remake for you. Simple words, strong words, words that reshape Peter. And set him on a new trajectory. On a new path. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. That was a word. A vital message from Peter. You, you read the epistles that he wrote after. And you'll see. First and second Peter. You see that Peter's heart really. Was about taking care of God's sheep. And so this man who had messed up, this jar of clay, this instrument that we would write off as fail. And sometimes when we look for a character in the Bible who denied Jesus, apart from Judas, we always call out Peter. But you know what? That thank God, that's not the end of the story. God had a remake. For Peter. And God's vital message to Peter. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. If you love me. Love me to the extent. That you will do. Whatever. I tell you to do. When we face challenges. And circumstances in our lives. Somehow God comes alongside us. Or sends somebody our way. Or speaks to us from the pulpit. Or gives us a word from a book. Or even use a little child. Innocent child. And that child could have never imagined or known. The impact and the import of the words that it is speaking. But God speaks to us in a very clear way. Because God is about reshaping and remolding and reforming and fashioning in us. So brothers and sisters, if you're in a place where 
You are like that lump of clay in the hands of the potter marred. Not where you're supposed to be. Not the kind of person that God wants you to be. I want to encourage you. Like God spoke to Jeremiah and sent him down there for him to have this object lesson. God says, He hasn't given up on you. And you don't have to give up on yourself. Because He's still at work in you. The beautiful thing about pottery, and I wondered, contemplated, why the, the house of the potter could have been some other place, could have been some other occupation, but pottery is very interesting for many reasons. One is the item that you use, the raw material that you use to make the vessel is dirt. Literally dirt. But when that dirt is crafted, it ends up in palaces. It ends up at the dining table of presidents, of kings, of queens celebrities it ends up in places that when you first saw the raw material there's no way anyone would want dirt to be on their table but that's where they're eating from it's dirt they're eating from but the important thing is a process the important thing is the process the process the process of firing, and that's why the, the term is used as you put that, that clay in the kiln. You have to put it through the fire. It has to go through a lot of heat. And then there's a lot of glazing to give it a shade, to make it beautiful, to make it lovely. Brothers and sisters, we may go through the fire and God may still be doing his glazing work in us. Because some of us might be rough at the edges. Some of us might not be where God wants us to be. Some of us, nobody wants to be a penny for us or a cent for us. Maybe a cent eyes has more value when you are a product in the making. But I tell you, God, the master craftsman, works to reshape and reform at the Protestant line. Maybe you're thinking that you have no value, no worth. Maybe you are a runaway child. Maybe you are one of those that I spoke about earlier in that poem. Church is hard for you. Because you're not where God wants you to be. I want to say that the hand of God is reaching forth to you. And God is saying, I will make you into the beautiful vessel that you ought to be. What are some of the things that God uses to make us? To remake us? I want to share four of them with you. First of all, I like to say that God uses pain p-a-i-n pain to make us to remake us there is purpose in pain there is purpose in pain not many of us like to hear that because we have been doctrinated or indoctrinated to believe that once you are a Christian, you should not experience pain. You should not suffer. That life should be hunky-dory for you. But I tell you, that is not in the Bible. 
And that is not true in real life. I would like you to present somebody to me. And not me because I'm not the expert. But take that person to the neurologist. And tell the neurologist that this person feels no pain. Bravo! This is a great thing. Or whatever is the medical science that has to do with pain. The branch of medical science that has to do with pain. The doctor will declare that something is wrong with you. In order for us to be human, we have to feel pain. Because pain is a mechanism that helps us to know that something is not right. Something needs fixing. Something needs to be addressed. And so, brothers and sisters, in as much as we do not like pain, pain has a vital function in our body. Pain has a vital function in our spiritual life as well. Pruning is a process that produces pain. It's only that the trees don't talk, you know. But pruning is a process that takes out, that cuts out, that cuts away. And we are called to recognize that God is not bad. You know, the devil wants us to believe that because we go through hardships, because we come to pain in our lives, or pain comes to us in our lives, that God is bad. Brothers and sisters, what God wants us to know is that we can trust him with all of our lives. He's there for us. Of course, pain causes disappointment. Pain causes hurt. Pain causes us to be in that place where we want to be in despair. We want to give up. Pain causes us to want to, to turn our backs on the purposes that God has in store for us. God wants us to know He is there with us. Isaiah chapter 6 tells us of the prophet Isaiah declaring that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. What happened? Isaiah was a man who was well connected. Bible scholars tell us that, Isaiah, that Uzziah was one of his relatives. Isaiah was in a place of influence. Isaiah was in a place where he had a lot of clout. Where he was in the high society realm. Where Uzziah gave him cover for a lot of things. And then bam! The rug was pulled from under his feet. The carpet was removed from under his feet. But then the purposes of God came true. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He had a recommission, he had a refocusing. Here was this prophet who found ease in a place where everything was going well. But that was not God's purpose. That was not God's purpose. And God caused him to see that there was a higher calling on his life. And spending ease in the king's court. One of those things that God will take away from you and from me that will cause us to recognize that He's still God. Not because He wants to punish us, but because He wants to extend His grace to us. And so when we ask, three times Paul says, I ask Him to take this thing away from me. And then He says, now, my grace, my grace, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. So brothers and sisters, there are many people in the Bible, in contemporary life, there are many of us here in the congregation or on Zoom. You can testify that the trajectory of your life changed as a result of a very dark, difficult 
debilitated sometimes experience. Something that did not go right when you had it set this way. When your trajectory was going that you were going this way, it did not work out. And God used that to bring you in line with his purposes. Pain. God can use that to chip away. God can use that to form, to reform, to shape. God can use that to do the remake in our lives. Pain. But let me hurry on to the next instrument that God could use to bring us as clay, he the master potter, to fulfill his purposes, to do the remaking us. I want to submit to you that God can use pleasure to remake us. God can use pleasure to remake us. You might be thinking, well, at the one end of the spectrum is pain, and now you're going to tell me that God can use pleasure? Some of us don't even like to hear the word pleasure because we don't associate Christianity with pleasure. You know, some of us who think to be righteous, you have to be so sour, sunburned, be in that place where you can't smile and can't laugh and anything like that. We represent Jesus because we're talking. And anybody only smile, you only skin your teeth. I bind you in the name of Jesus because you skin, you bind your skin teeth, demon, and all kind of stuff. Brothers and sisters, God's word tells us, Romans chapter two, verse four, that the goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. Sometimes we think that God, you have to zap them to get them. And God says, no, for that one, I have another plan. I will so bountifully reach out to them in their needs that they can't help but say, God, I don't deserve this. God, I don't deserve this. The story, Jesus himself tells the story of the prodigal son. A story that you would have thought should have concluded, should have climaxed with this boy getting the licks of Lisbon for all that he did. This boy being relegated to a, a third or fourth class member of the family, if any at all. Not for all that he did. As a matter of fact, the brother who was at home when this young man returned. You coming back here and don't deserve this and I don't want to have anything to do with you but the father heart of God brings us to see that we can lavish grace in order to change people pray for those who despisefully use love them, love your enemies love your enemies, brothers and sisters we can change the trajectory of people's lives when we, instead of giving them judgment, we can give them grace. The prodigal son is a case in point. He who deserved judgment, instead Jesus himself tells this story to make a point. And the father's heart about changing people, sometimes is about giving them grace. And the goodness of the Lord brings us to that place of repentance. This is not to put a stamp on approval of rebellion and rejection of God and walking away from God and, and all of that. Not at all. Jesus was not making that point. The point Jesus was making was that the heart of the Father is full of grace to those who are erring. That's what he did with Peter. When Peter turned away in terms of who Christ was to him and the purposes he had, Jesus came back looking for Peter and said, I've got work for you to do. Pleasure is important. Can I encourage some of us to wish more people well, to bless more people, to smile more at people, to encourage them, even when they don't believe 
of what you believe, still be nice to them. Still show them the love of God. Still let them know that you and Dessa, that's, that's what they're doing to you, but you have a different order. Let the love of God flow from your heart to theirs. Brothers and sisters, there are two other points I want to make and I'm going to just mention them and then bring the message to a close. God can use prophecies. God can use prophecies to change us. Judges chapter 6 tells us of a young man. As a matter of fact, the social context is painted already. It was a difficult time. The Midianites were coming, invading the, the Israelites. They, Israel was in a bad shape. It seemed like ever so often, when they've got a sigh of re, a, a relief and they breathe a sigh of relief and they're having themselves in a good way, then some of the problem of calamity come and you trace it back disobedience to God. And so, the one that came to Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, me? You got the wrong address, you got the wrong man. You must set me up. Right now, me and my family are the worst, and I'm the worst of the worst. And look what we're going through. If God was with us and all of that, you think we would have gone through what we're going through now? Brothers and sisters, I want to say to you that that messenger from God had the right address. He was talking to the right man, but it's just that Gideon did not come into that understanding of what God had been store for him. I do not deserve what you're saying. I'm incapable. As a matter of fact, we are treading wheat in a wine press. Wheat in a wine press. There's a flour in an oil mill, rice flour, you're making with a coconut oil mill. No! Constructed differently, but here was a place of hiding. Here was a place of protection. Here was a place that he was running for just for his own survival. Brothers and sisters, there are times when for our own survival, we think that we have to go a certain place and we go off course. But when God speaks to us and God says, I have got plans for you. I want to reroute you. I want to put you back in line. I want you to go a certain way. I want you to fulfill the purpose for which you've been born. You mighty man of valor. And then God says, when God says to us, when he gives us a prophetic word, whether it is a word to Peter, whether it is a word to Gideon, whether it is a word to you, whatever is a prophetic word, sometimes we dismiss it, we despise prophesy, we dismiss it, me, because we look at what is, and maybe we look at what was, the past tense and the present tense, when God's word in a prophetic way is for the future. God wants to bring some things to pass, brothers and sisters, God wants to reshape us, God wants to remold us, no matter who says what, if God says it, he will bring it to pass. You just hold strain. You just stay right there. You just do what he tells you to do. Walk in obedience. And God will bring it to pass. What is it that God has for you and called you to do but you're not yet seeing? Don't sell yourself short. Don't be carried away by the enticements that come before you as alternatives. I want to say, stay the course. God is faithful. God is faithful. Finally, I'd like to say, without much elaboration, is that God will also use people. God can also use people to bring us back online, to reshape us, to remind us. In spite of our own feelings that we are self-made, that I can make it on my own, we all do need people. 
We all do need people. We all do need people. A few months ago, I was doing a survey about mentoring in the Caribbean, a Caribbean-wide survey. And there were two parts to the research. One was an interview in terms of methodology. One was an interview and the other was a questionnaire online. The interview was targeting people who were senior leaders across the Caribbean in the church or Christian ministry. And one of the questions I asked was, had it not been for Dash Blank, You would not be in your ministry today. I would not be in ministry. I would not be where I am today. Brothers and sisters, that was one of the most moving experiences for me. Some of the people I interviewed, I'm not at liberty to tell you the full story in terms of who said what and all of that. But I, I'm at liberty to tell you some of the findings of the research. And you know what? Many of the people who are in ministry today, many of the people who are serving God today, many of the people that we celebrate today, they, would, they said they would not have been where they are today had it not been. And some of them called names. Some of them identified. Some of them spoke of their feelings. Some of them were very vulnerable. Some of them shared where they were. And so today you are seeing them with titles and ministries and all of that. But they remember the journey that they came through. And they remember people who were there for them. Brothers and sisters, as we read through the scriptures, we will see. That there are many men and women who have been remade. Because God allowed people to come alongside them. If you are a Lone Ranger today. If you do not want to expose your life to others, I want to say to you that you are not fulfill all that God wants you to fulfill in your life. Because that is when we are prone to be carried away to go off track. That is when we are prone because of our own accountability to be in places and to be doing things that God does not want of us. God sent Jeremiah down to that daughter's house because he wanted Israel to know that he is able to recast, to remove, to remake that nation. God is challenging us today. Likewise, for us to know that he is still in the business of reshaping, reforming, refashioning. If you are a believer today, but you're not where God wants you to be, I want to encourage you, get back to Jesus. Hear his word. I want to encourage you, get back to Jesus. Hear his word, the voice of the Spirit. I want to say to you, get back to Jesus. Think of the ways that he's presently working in life through pleasure, through pain, through prophecies, through people. And hear what he's saying to you. And surrender yourself to him. If you are not a believer, I also have a word for you. I want to say to you that God wants to form you and fashion you. God wants to possess you, to take charge of you. God wants to make you into his image. But if you've not yet trusted him as your savior, first of all, and if you've not made him Lord, then I want to say to you today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He's calling you to surrender. He's calling you to say, Lord, here am I. Lord, make me to the vessel that you want me to be. Because you and I can't be self-made. God has got to be the one to make us. And maybe you too, with pain, with pleasure, with prophecies, with 
people around you. God wants you to know that he loves you and cares for you. But all you need to do is to surrender your life to him. All you need to do is to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me a new person. Lord, I surrender myself to you, my own to you. I want you to be my savior because I need a savior. And I want you to be my Lord because you should be the most important person in my life. Would you bow your head with me at this time and let us pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you spoke the words to the children of Israel. You sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house. Lord, and the message is still relevant to us today that as you are, that you are in the remaking business. That you are in the making a new business because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Lord, the old creation, Lord God, is passed, is put aside. Lord, you make us new. Lord, we ask you today as we invite you into our hearts, into our lives, Lord, into our circumstances. Make us afresh, Lord. Make us a new, oh God, we pray. In your mighty and precious name. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, God bless you.